Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely Sunday afternoon. Today what I'd like to discuss is what the New York State Right to Repair Bill means to small repair shops like mine. I'd like to discuss this in three segments. What the bill says, what will most likely happen, and what I would like to see actually happen. This bill says that manufacturers must make available the same parts, tools, manuals, etc. that they make available to their authorized repair shops to schmucks like me. Now, what is actually going to happen? Well, this bill is not going to take effect until one year after it is passed, so even if it's signed by the governor today, it's going to be summer of 2023 before this actually goes into effect. Now, once the bill goes into effect, do you think that's the end? Hell no. When it comes to the automotive right to repair bill that passed by ballot initiative in Massachusetts in November of 2020, that is still in court to this day with automotive manufacturers going back and forth in court to say that that is not something that they can pass in that state, that it's unconstitutional and so on and so forth. So even if this is signed into law, come summer of 2023, you bet your ass that manufacturers that have spent millions of dollars in lobbying campaigns and PR campaigns to convince you and legislators that this is bad are not going to give up that easily. There's most likely going to be some sort of court challenge. And again, for the automotive bill, we're almost into two years into that at this point. So let's just fast forward a little bit. 2025, 2026, four years from now, what happened in 2025 or 2026 when this finally goes through the court process and is seen to be okay? At that point, are they going to comply and give us everything that we're asking for? Again, I I wish I could be that optimistic. Most likely not the case. So what are we asking for? When I do these videos where I do board repairs or screen repairs or anything else, I'm saying that it's very difficult to do repairs because often we cannot get access to the parts that we need to do our job without going through some bullshit Lord of War and Nicolas Cage-like supply chain. I want access not to a $900 motherboard that goes into a $1,000 computer. I want access to the $5 to $15 chip that went bad on that motherboard. I do not want access to a $500 to $1,000 screen assembly. I want access to a $50 to $150 screen. When you break your screen, your hinges are still okay. Your wiring is still okay. Your webcam is still okay. Your entire metal display casing, all of that is still okay. Usually, all you need is the screen. When you have an issue with your keyboard, I do not want to buy a top case that costs two or three or $400 with everything attached to it and all the metal, the housing, etc. I want to buy just the keyboard for 10 to 30 bucks because, again, that's all I need. Now, this bill says that you must make available what you make available to your authorized repair providers. And one of the reasons that I am not an authorized repair provider from Apple or anybody else is because they don't allow us to do economically viable repairs. I cannot buy a $5 chip or a $15 chip, even if I become authorized. I can buy the motherboard which costs usually almost as much as the entire computer and makes the repair completely not economically viable for the customer. So, you may be asking, what's the point of a bill that says make available what you make available to your authorized repair providers if you barely make anything available to the authorized repair provider? And that's a great question. The way the bill text is written, this means depot repair, not just authorized repair providers. What's the difference there? Well, anybody, if they want to jump through all the hoops to become authorized for somebody like Apple or Samsung, can do so and open up a little shop like mine and say that they're authorized, unlike me, and have a repair shop. But that's not depot repair. Depot repair is when they buy the $900 motherboard that goes into the $1,000 computer or whatever, and at that point sends the old board back to Apple. That will typically go to some sort of depot repair facility that then actually fixes that board and makes it work again so that it can be used inside of a refurbished computer. That's depot repair. That's not something that just any old person can get access to, nor is that something that's done retail. But they are the people that get access to all these little things that we use in our shop every day to be able to do our job. And that is the distinction that is most likely going to have to be fought back and forth in court if they decide to say, well, all we're making available is this and you just have to deal with it. Because again, at the end of the day, that's pretty useless. This is what the Apple Independent Repair Provider Program and what the Apple Self-Service Repair Program are doing. Apple's IRP program makes available to independent repair shops a lot of the same stuff that they make available to authorized repair shops, which again is nothing. I mean, no motherboard schematics, no chips, no LCD by itself. You can't even buy an iPhone charge port through that program. And the Apple self-service repair program looks like it is set up to make everything that's through the IRP program available to any old person that wants to purchase it. So it is much easier for a company like this to take their watered-down useless repair programs that they use for their authorized repair providers and just make a version that works for everybody. That's far easier than coming up with a system that actually gives us access to what we need to do real repairs. And the reason that a repair shop 
shop like mine was so popular 10 to 15 years ago, even when I was a broke schmuck in sweatpants working out of Herald Square Park without an office, is because I was willing to do repairs that the authorized repair providers were not able to do. So most likely there is going to be that spat going back and forth where we say, hey, we want access to what the people who do the depot repair have access to, not this authorized repair bullshit where, you, you, again, you can't even get access to a charge port. But the problem there is going to be that just like a co- the court battle in Massachusetts to deal with the automotive right to repair bill, this is going to probably be yet another one of those. And it's something that I'd really like to avoid. So there's a lot of battles for these little types of semantics that will most likely happen, but those battles won't even be able to happen until the law is fought out in court. That's most likely not even going to happen until it becomes a law, which is going to be, again, one year from the date that it gets signed in, and it hasn't even been signed by the governor yet. So what does this mean for today, for right now? It doesn't mean really much of anything. Really, all it means is leverage for a future conversation. You see, one thing that's very important to understand is that the passing of this bill right now means jack shit. What it really is, is it's an opportunity. It's a little piece of leverage that allows us to potentially start having real conversations with manufacturers that we were unable to have before. Why bother having the conversation with some schmuck that runs a repair shop that curses into a camera? If that schmuck that curses into a camera is able to help in pushing bills forward in 17 states and actually getting one of them passed in a state that has over 20 million people, many of them hipsters that use Apple products, then there's actually some leverage that can be used to try and get a foot in the door for a conversation on how things can be different going forward. And that's how I see this bill. In terms of me being able to get access to any of these chips or anything that I use in these repairs that I talk about or screens or anything else... That's like half a decade away, at least. But what this is, is a foot in the door. That's what it means. And that brings me to the final part of this video. What would I like to see happen? What I'd like to see happen are actual productive conversations between members of the repair community and the manufacturers themselves. Let's work together. You want to produce products that people love. We want to make sure that they continue working when you don't want to repair them. You're not wanting to repair them. You're not wanting to do component level repair and data recovery and LCD only repair. That's fine. At the end of the day, what I'd like to do is have conversations with these manufacturers. We can figure out how do we bypass this? How do we, we've already been bickering back and forth for the past nine years. How can we avoid bickering back and forth for the next six? How can we make it so that you can continue doing what you do? which is making devices that people love to use, and we could continue doing what we do, providing them with repair experiences that make them actually happy that they own something with this logo on the back rather than miserable. What can we do to make it easy for everybody? I don't know. Maybe... You could, there are certain parts that you could sell. Maybe you don't want to sell these parts. You don't want to deal with that. So the manufacturer of them, or LG, or Intersil, or Texas Instruments, they can sell to a company like Asset Genie, or Mouser, 10000 or 100000 at a time, just wire transfer, you know, no credit cards, no refunds, no anything like that. And then that distributor can then resell to the retail schmucks like us. Let's work out how to make this work. You don't have to be the company that's doing the sales. You don't have to be the company arranging everything. How can we arrange this logistically so that it works for us? and we go what we need to do our jobs, and you get to continue focusing on what you want to focus on, which is making products that people love. This is not just something that's going out to Apple. My email is open, lewis at fighttorepair.org, but to other manufacturers that are concerned with how they could comply with this type of bill as well. I want everybody here to actually be able to get along and feel like they are not getting screwed. I want to bypass what I just... I have a spidey sense it's going to happen, which is six years of back and forth infighting in legislatures, court systems, and then people saying, hey, this bill was supposed to get me access to that, not this. Let's squash all this. Let's start fresh. Let's see what we can do. Let's work together. And let's see if we can actually create a repairable world. Maybe I'm dreaming. But one thing that I think is really important to understand here This isn't going away. I started talking about this issue on this channel when I had less than 10 subscribers, and I was surprised that anybody was clicking here. It has 1.7 million subscribers now. There are bills being pushed in over 17 states, an agricultural one that's going to be getting pushed federally soon, and a bill that passed in my old home state. This is not going away. It's going to continue rolling down the hill. More people are aware of this issue. More legislators are aware of this issue. More people and companies that represent large board positions on these corporate boards are starting to request that right to repair be paid attention to. This is not an issue that's going away, I assure you. We are going to have to learn to live with each other. Let's start. I'm willing to take the first step. Like, I'm wearing a blue polo shirt. Okay, it's not a dark blue polo shirt, but I can't go that far just yet. But in all seriousness, let's see what we can do. Let's see how we can work together. Let's see if we can start fresh and actually work towards a more repairable world. That's it for today, 
And as always, I hope you learned something.